So 1 John chapter number 3, if you have your Bibles tonight, 1 John chapter number 3. And I think all the songs tonight have, have really um, went right to where we're going tonight with this passage of Scripture about the love of God and what He's done, our great Savior. 1 John chapter 3. I'd like to begin in verse number 1, though that's not where our passage is tonight. Where John says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Listen, I hope you read this passage sometime in your devotions, and I hope verse number 2 just grips your heart. Because there's going to be a day when this little body that we've got, aches, pains, arthritis, all those, all those moaning and groaning, it's going to be gone. Amen. We shall see him, for we shall, be, uh, we shall see him as he is, and we'll be like him. What a great day that's going to be. Amen. Right, I'm glad that this is not all there is to it. Aren't you? Amen. If this is all there is to it, Paul says we are, all, are of all men most miserable. All right, I'm glad there's something else, but I digress. That's not where we're at tonight. Just a side note, verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth the law, also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children... Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil... Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And now we come to verse 11 through 18, our text for tonight. For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. We looked at this two weeks ago, that Cain acted like he was. He was evil, therefore his works were evil. He was of his father, the wicked one, therefore his works followed his, what he was, his nature. Or we can say it this way a lot simple, uh, more, more simple, what's inside will always come out. And this is what John is saying. John says, listen, it's not that my actions outside will determine my inside. He is not saying if you act right, then you'll be right. He's saying if you're saved, a child of God, then you will act correctly. All right? Not that he's saying you'll be perfect. He dealt with that in chapter number 2, verse 1 and 2. All right? So don't go down that rabbit trail here. He dealt with that. But he's saying what's in here will come out. And Cain just acted inside of his own nature. So he's going to present to us tonight a different nature. We looked at this two weeks ago, a nature of love. And verse 13, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. I talked about this a couple weeks ago. That is a, sometimes a difficult verse to walk through. I know, I don't know exactly what it means. I know what it doesn't mean. All right, on first glance, you say, well, no murderer can ever be saved, but we know that that cannot be true based on the entire rest of the Bible. All right, we know that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. It doesn't say except unless you're murderers. So, so I know that. I know that if I read my Bible correctly that, that David was guilty of murder, but David was also called a man after God's own heart. Right, and I believe with all of my being in, in life that David is in heaven. He is a believer. All right, Saul, who became Paul, was also guilty in uh, an association with murder. No doubt in my mind that Saul, now is called Paul, is in heaven. So what it cannot mean that if someone commits murder, they cannot be saved. It cannot mean that. 
right, based on Scripture. Scripture does not contradict itself. What I believe one possible explanation is that this idea of hatred toward another, which Jesus equated with murder, why did he equate that? Well, he equated it because he said this is of a different nature. You're, you're, the devil, your father, the devil, he brought hatred, all right, into, into this, and a Christian does not have that as part of his nature. I, I believe one explanation of what he's saying is, listen, when you're saved, you're supposed to cast off the works of darkness. And this hatred being one of the most heinous works of darkness. Hatred toward other believers. And here, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and sees his brother in need, or have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children. See how John jumps back to that little term of endearment? My friends, my little children, let me, let me teach you something. He's saying, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Lord, I thank you for this passage. I pray for your help these next short minutes, Lord. Lord, short because we're often bombarded on a regular basis of worldly thoughts and philosophies. Lord, the devil's trying to distract us and well, the world's trying to influence our minds. Well, we have just a small amount of time now to look at your word in comparison. But Lord, we know that your word is truth. Your word transforms our hearts and minds. I pray these next few moments, Lord, will be valuable. That we would in our hearts respond to the truth from your word in a way that would be worthy of what you've called us to, the vocation. Lord, may we handle your word sincerely and honestly. Lord, may you accomplish everything that you want to accomplish in your word would please not return void. In your precious name I ask. Amen. John says, my little children, my little children, my little ones who I love, who I want to help, let, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Tonight, the entire point of this message will be, are you loving with your actions? That's what he says. Or can we say it this way, talk is cheap. Maybe a little more in the vernacular. Talk is cheap. About a week and a half ago, gentlemen, you had or passed Valentine's Day. How was Valentine's Day? Talk is cheap. Well, Valentine's Day, it's a made-up, it's a made-up Hallmark holiday. Said every man who forgot to Valentine's Day. I refuse, refuse to celebrate this terrible day brought about to us by pagans, said those who not only forgot but have no extra cash to celebrate Valentine's Day. But a select few of you men and women remembered about that Valentine's Day. Women, you have the, the same excuses, the, the same uh, the problems, you excuse it differently though. Well, my husband should buy me flowers on Valentine's Day. That means you ladies forgot Get your husband something, and you'd expect, 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 all right? You know, Valentine's Day, the, the purpose is to express what? Love. Yeah, should it be a, a unidirectional expression or bidirectional? Is it supposed to go one way or supposed to flow both ways? Come on, help me here. Which way? Both ways or one way? So it's not just for the men to express for the women but for the, or for the women to the men, but it's supposed to be I love my my spouse, and she loves me, so we express our love toward each other in this tremendous holiday we now celebrate, second only to Christmas and Easter, Resurrection Day, as Valentine's Day, followed closely by Sweetest Day, and some were past that in the, in the drudgery of human minds is a little thing called an anniversary, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> Valentine's Day. What's special about Valentine's Day? Let me tell you a few special things about Valentine's Day. One, the price of roses triples, if not quadruples, in this world. Cards, all right, begin flowing freely on the shelves about the beginning of January. 
And normally a car that you can pick up for a dollar or two dollars are now six and seven. And if you truly love this spouse, this person, girlfriend, boyfriend, or children, then you, then you spend the extra money that you maybe don't have in life. For children and, and classes, they have these Valentines you give, and they say, you know, you're the star, and you know, all these little these things, and the kids felt uh, the uh, Valentines. And schools are filled with Valentine's Day parties, right? You have those little hearts that have little words on them, right? You know what I'm talking about, those little hearts? Strangely have no purpose in life outside of Valentine's Day. They taste disgusting. Yet strangely around Valentine's, you can't help but eat them. Oh, this is special, and you find you throwing yourself in your mouth. Valentine's Day. See, at Valentine's Day, we can perceive the love of someone else. But look at verse 16 for me, if you would, where John says, Hereby perceive we the love of God. He says uh, he, want us, he wants us to recognize something here in verse number 16. He wants us to recognize, to know, to grasp, to distinguish the importance of the love of God for you and for me. You see, I can perceive my wife's love. How, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. She sometimes writes me little notes. If I go to camp in my, in my bag, I'll find a note for every night that I am gone. Little notes she sticks in. I perceive the love of my wife. She does the little things that make me smile. And... Believe it or not, she tells me that she loves me, and her nose doesn't even grow. I perceive, I understand, I can grasp, maybe my wife really loves me. And I hope she can perceive my love for her. Valentine's Day, I bought her a dozen roses, and I think by 2021, I'll have them paid off. <laughs> no, it was good for a dozen roses, wasn't it, Brother Mark, in a in a separate vase, and I, I bought them locally. I try to buy those things local, support local businesses. Sure. Sometimes I, or more often than not, I try to do the dishes in the house. <laughs> See, now I'm on record doing that. Now you folks know. Because I want to know that I love her. And, believe it or not, I also tell her that I love her as well. Hopefully she perceives my love for her, Right? How do my kids perceive the love of their father? A couple different ways. I tell them I love them. I drive them around. They can't really drive yet. I wait for them. I spend vast amounts of money on them. Hopefully they perceive that as a dad, I love them, right? I found this, uh, the top ten things we would have loved to hear our father say to us. All right, sorry, Dad, you should have had this... 15 years or 20 years ago. How about this number 10? Could you please turn your music up louder so I can enjoy it too? <laughs> number 9, curfew is just a general time to shoot for. I'm not running a prison here. <laughs> How about this one? Uh, something you love your father to say? I don't mind air conditioning the whole neighborhood. Go ahead and leave the doors open. <laughs> Number seven, looks like we're lost. No problem, I better stop and ask for directions. Listen, there's no future in asking for directions. No future. By the time that you stop and get out of your vehicle, you can find your way back to where you thought you may have been going in the first place. All right? So don't do it. Number six, you wish your father said, make all the rackets you want, I can sleep through anything. Yeah, I said, no father ever. Number five, you like this one, Brother Mark, my tools are your tools. Help yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's how tools end up outside all winter long. Yeah. Or number four, your taste in clothes is quite remarkable. While I'm gone, please feel free to invite all of your friends over. Or this one holding, this remote is such a burden. Someone else, please take it out of my hand for a while. Number one, top ten things we wish our father would say, your chores can wait to go have fun. <laughs> yeah, you haven't heard that one yet, have you, Mr. Gold, really? Yeah, Dad hasn't said that one yet. It's unlikely that fathers will ever say that, so boys, don't hold your breath. Daniel, don't hold your breath. 
The fact is it's okay as long as the fathers say the things are truly needed, things like, I'm proud of you and I love you. And God our Father said these words to us, I love you. Hereby perceive we this love, the love of Christ, the love of God. How do we perceive it? Because he laid down his life for us. See, love recognizes in this passage something. We, he wants us to perceive the love of Christ, to, to grasp it, to know it, to recognize it, to, to know what distinguishes it. There are times in our life that we will be, uh, that the love of God will be questioned in our minds. Sometimes from outside influences, well, if your God really loved you, then why would, why would he let that happen to you? I thought you were a Christian. I thought your God had love for you. Sometimes they'll question God in a universal sense. Well, if God truly was loving, then how could he let that huge catastrophic event happen over there and those thousands of people perish? If God truly were love, how would he do that? Somehow misperceiving, misunderstanding the love of God. You see, John doesn't say, Here, hereby perceive we the love of God that your life will be free from all trouble. He doesn't say, hereby perceive we the love of God that nothing ever bad will happen in the entire universe for all of time. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, hereby perceive we the love of God. That what? He laid down his life for us. He said, you remember, you recognize that this love of God resulted in someone sacrificing for you. Hey, can we kind of go on a little rabbit trail here for just a moment and say, hey, the next time you're in a pity party for yourself, remember that Christ died for you? And the next time you're feeling sorry for yourself, usually when I feel sorry for myself, the circumstances are very, very minor. All right, something more inconvenient in my life. I'm not downplaying uh, catastrophes in your life in any way, shape, or form. I am downplaying our own reactions to our minor inconveniences. Our car breaks down. Oh, my goodness. Can't even have a car that works. Not remembering that for 364 days of the year, our car works just fine. But because of our failure to change the oil in the last 400,000 miles... All right, and watching every, ignoring every warning light in our vehicle, then it's somehow God's fault. And oh my goodness, can we next time maybe have the perspective that that God truly loves us and not call His love into question because of a minor inconvenience in our life? Ah, oh, I didn't get this accolade that I wanted. I didn't get maybe a a job accolade. A, Promotion or bonus, does God love me? My kids didn't succeed like I thought they should have. Oh, a minor inconvenience, and boy, is this thing worth it. And John says, listen, perceive the love of Christ. And this love is, is perceivable in this manner, that he laid down his life for you. That Christ gave himself for you. That's the perspective. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Don't forget, we're going to get there in a few weeks, that we love him because he first loved us. There was nothing lovely about you or me, but God commended, Romans chapter 5, his love toward us in that while we were yet vile, filthy, ugly, cursed to hell and damnation sinners, all right, while we were yet sinners, that's when Christ showed his love for us. Hereby perceive this love, because this is not a natural love. This is a supernatural love. And he says, perceive it. He says, oh, and by the way, model it. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He doesn't say just for your own flesh and blood, but for the, for the family, for the church family, for that person who took the last jelly donut this morning. He said, Pastor, I not only will not lay down my life for that person, I will take their life if they touch my donut again. <laughs> and some of you, I switched the donuts to the middle of the hallway, and I'm about to have the, uh, we thought the tribulation time had come here at First Baptist Church. He says, not only do you perceive it, you're supposed to model it. 
Or can we say it this way? The spirit by which Christ has laid down his life for us must be preeminent in our thoughts with others. How would our actions for others be different if we realize we're the canvas upon which they can read God's love story? How much different will we act? We're talking right now toward other Christians. That's where the application is. It's not a pay it forward at, the, at Starbucks or McDonald's. So those are good things. This is not about the unsaved world. This is just for Christians right here. It's for Christians. And he says among other Christians, you ought to have the same love that Christ showed. Have it for everybody else who's a Christian. There's a renowned author who is what does what's called alternative literature. Times where books are, are a fiction are hypertext, or they're just strings of thought and glimpses of storylines. Sometimes with a hypertext, you have to follow the links all through the internet just to find a story together. It's kind of like they've done with music in the 20th century. They've like decomposed things. Now they're decomposing books. All right? They're deregulating these things. And this is, but she had an intriguing work. She called the story Skin. A 2,095-word literary piece, which Shelley termed a mortal work of art. What she did, she uh, gathered 2,095 different volunteer participants from all over the world, every corner of the world, to participate in this project, and then tattooed one word of their story of her story on their skin. So in order to read the entire story, you had to come across and order all 2,095 people. How weird, first of all. I said, how weird. But intriguing. Because each participant carries a piece of the complete story. Yet each carries a complete story into themselves. They are living, breathing fragments of a story. And if I can but help draw the comparison as Christians, he's chosen to use a human canvas to bear his message. As imperfect as you and I are, God has chosen this canvas to bear his message. And we go about our daily lives a fragment, living, breathing of this redemptive work. The Apostle Paul said we're living epistles, quickened epistles. And as a piece of the whole, we have a tale to tell. But sometimes we hide those mortal, if our mortal actions, the immortal words. But the immortal thing that God has done in our life and our heart that ought to be displayed prominently so one else can read it sometimes masked. You see, hereby perceive we the love of Christ, of God. He laid down His life, and we ought to have the same spirit for others, other Christians. So a Christian can read the canvas of our life, our actions, and say, ah, I know why you're so kind. Because you're merely showing me the love of Christ that you've been shown. Your, your action, your response in my ugliness was supernatural. I know why. I perceive, I perceive the love in your life because it's the love of my Savior. And remember, He loved us when we're ugly. That's when love is truly shown, is it not? Hey, love's not shown when, when everything's going great. Love is truly shown when things are ugly. When that fellow Christian has done something to hurt your relationship. A harsh word, a critical spirit, a negative comment. It's amazing the stories that you hear from people who have never come back to church. Not normally because God has failed them, but because another Christian has failed them. Right? Another Christian treated them incorrectly, and I'm not excusing the behavior in any way, shape, or form. But love is shown in the harshness, in the ugliness. At least that's when 
Christ's love was shown for us. And he says, that is the love we're supposed to model. I'm not drawing this out of thin air. It's right there. He, he did that for us when it was ugly. And he says, so you do it and lay down your lives for the brethren. Do the same thing that Christ did. Do it for someone else when it's ugly. He goes on to say this, that love responds. Verse 17, 18, but whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Richard Wormbrand, he was a Romanian pastor. He suffered months of solitary confinement, years of physical torture, constant suffering from hunger and cold, and mental cruelty, all the while being 14 years in communist prisons. He wrote a book entitled Tortured for Christ. In his book, he writes this, When we were given one slice of bread a week, we decided that we would faithfully tithe even that. Every tenth week, we took the slice of bread and gave it to the weaker brethren as to our master. Showing the love of Christ toward the brethren. Uh, of anyone, you could say, listen, if you're in a communist prison and, and all you get are, are small, or he says one slice of bread a week, uh, surely God would let you eat the bread in, 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 as a small token of his grace, right? Yet his love for Christ, so clearly perceived, was shown as love toward others, the weaker brethren. This is what John is saying. He said, you claim to love me, you claim to see my love in your life, you claim to be thankful, then why don't you show it to somebody else because talk is cheap. I have something, my brother needs something, don't close the bowels of mercy. You see, love explains itself in actions. And love demonstrates itself for others. The early church did this a certain way. It's not the model for, for us. It was in Jerusalem. They sold all of their goods, and they basically lived communally. Whoever had need took out of this big pot of money. It was, that's not reported so that we do the same thing. It was just explained, this is what they did. If I can recall your mind to the, to the account of Ananias and Sapphira, who had the grand idea, well, we want to be part of this. We see that people, when they give to this thing, are, are honored in a big way, so we want to be in this mix as well. And the Bible tells us that they sold a piece of property. And now, there was no command ever in Scripture that if you sell property, you have to give it all to the church so everyone else can live off it. There's no command like that in Scripture. All right, there's a command to give and to be generous and to be cheerful while you generously give. But you don't have to give every, all the money of a piece of property. There's no command. But they had this, this brainstorm about we're going to sell the property and we'll give part of the money because that's a whole bunch of money, apparently. And the problem was they said, but we'll pretend like we're giving all the money. We'll pretend like we're giving all of the money because then we will be such respected, sacrificial, if I can, loving Christians. In a sense, it's like they're saying, well, because we love the church more than anybody else, this money that we gave, we're going to give all of it. But we love you more than me. You see the problem? That they begin to undermine the very essence of Christianity. That's, that's what John is teaching us here, that we show the love of Christ by our love toward another. And they're saying, listen, we love you so much, we're going to give everything that we sold on this property, except they weren't. There would, been, there would have been no problem, I believe, if they had said, listen, we sold property, we're going to give this much money to the church. No problem. In fact, they sold things and gave it to the church. Other people did, and, you know, no mention. But because of their deception, because of their pride, and because of their lack of presenting the love of Christ, it said, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? They both struck dead, one after the other, almost in succession, before the feet were even taken out, right? Then great fear came upon the church, the Bible tells us. Now, I tell you what, right now, that would cause fear at church. If at offering time, someone, the offering plate goes past, you put something in, and I call you out, 
You know, Brother Kemp, why are you lying to the Holy Ghost? Boom, and he drops dead. <laughs> then Mrs. Kemp, how much should you, how much should you give? You know, oh, whenever she says, wrong answer, boom. You can just imagine the service. Anyone else want to give today? <laughs> then great fear came upon the church. It wasn't about the fear. It was never the point of that. The point was, well, you represent Christ correctly. You don't lie to the Holy Ghost, all right, and really deceiving themselves. And John says, listen, if you're a true Christian, after you perceive the love of Christ, you need to love not in word and in tongue, because talk is cheap. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, and stab you in the back, you donut stealer. Oh, good to see you at church. I remember what you did when you were 13 years old, and don't forget that. If I can, sometimes, well, not, not just ladies, ladies and men, we have a problem with this. The Bible has a unique word for it called bitterness. Favorite phrase when dealing with people, I'm not bitter. Didn't think you were. Nothing in your demeanor or actions or words would lead me to, believe, to that conclusion. I just thought you had a problem. I'm not, I'm not bitter. I just can't get over this. It's bitterness. It's bitterness. Yeah, but they were, they were a jerk to me. No doubt about it. As if we've never been a jerk to somebody else. Come on, if we had confession time, we could all raise our hands at some point or another. Could we not? And, and, and somehow then, that excuses our spirit of bitterness, our lack of love. In word, we confess to love, but in action, love is not there. He says, if there's a need, how do you withhold what you've got? If there's a, if there's a problem, how do you not help? You say, well, pastor, how... I don't have that much money. I believe those actions go far beyond monetary actions. You pray for your fellow Christians? Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. There are people all over this auditorium who need your prayer, who need your prayer. I was telling Sunday school class this morning, what I often do if you ask me to pray for something, I, number one, I, I do my best to write it down immediately because I will forget. My mind's not that good. Then I try to put it into my phone with a reminder so it beeps at me when you're going through something. For some days it beeps a lot. Pray for this person, pray for this person. I, I want to pray. Well, 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 why would I just love in word and in tongue? Sure, brother, but pray for you. Sure, sister, be happy to pray for you. Talk is cheap. He says, let us not love in word and tongue, but in deed. Let us show our love one toward another. Sometimes it's monetary, sometimes it's, it's prayer, sometimes it's an encouragement, but it's showing the love of Christ. To whom? Our fellow Christians. This is not a strange concept. Don't forget that Jesus said this, by this shall all men know you're my disciples. He says this is the banner, this is the billboard, this is the sign, this is the mark by which everyone in the whole world will know that you're a Christian. If ye have love, help me here, one to another, to other Christians. He says, by the way you treat a fellow Christian will be the billboard by which everyone will know that you're Christ's disciple. Not by the shirt or tie you wear to church or the dress or whatever, but by your love one to another. See, John brings back that concept. It's what he desires from us. He entered Grand Central Station. It was rush hour. The place was a zoo, wall-to-wall -wall people. All he wanted to do was find his train and get to his seat and go home. The inevitable pushing and shoving ensued as he winded his way to the station, and just as he reached the platform, he saw his train. He quickened his pace, and just as he did, he accidentally banged into a little boy who'd been carrying a jigsaw puzzle the bits of which were now strewn all over the platform and were being squashed under the boots and shoes of the hurried passengers. The businessman looked at the situation and looked at his train. He saw the train begin to slowly move. He looked at the boy and looked at the jigsaw pieces and looked at the train. 
And then he put down his briefcase, got down on his hands and knees, and helped pick up all those pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. When he got done, he handed a little boy who looked into the face of the businessman and he said, Excuse me, sir, is your name Jesus? Fact is, you and I would give our right arm for somewhere, someone, someplace, somewhere this week to ask us the same question. But I wonder if anyone in this room would confuse you with Jesus because of the love that we perceive in him that we ought to show not in word and in tongue but in deed lord i thank you for your word lord i thank you for your love and lord i pray that you would touch our hearts that we would have the compassion this week that you want us to have. Lord, I pray that there's someone here who has become bitter toward another believer. Lord, that you will touch their heart. That you will not let them have rest from that. Lord, convict them. Challenge them, Lord. Lord, may we as Christians show your love that you so graciously so to us, to each other. Lord, that this church in this town, Lord, in Saginaw, Michigan, would be known as Christians who love Christians. Oh, Lord, help us. Lord, we're so prone to say the right things that our hearts be so selfish. In just a moment, the piano will play. We'll stand on our feet. I just ask you to be honest tonight. Is your talk cheap? Does your life match what we perceive from God? Just love for the Christians. Lord, bless his invitation. May we respond to the way you'd have us to.